I'd like to thank Time for Peace, um, the Committee on Lectures, and um, GSB for funding and bringing Maxine Nash um, to Iowa State tonight. Um, before I introduce Maxine, there are a few lectures and a few other things this week that I'd like to bring it to everyone's attention. Um, tomorrow, Wednesday, at 8 p.m. in this room, the sunroom, Norman Neurider from the, he's the advisor um, for the Center of Science, Technology, and Security Policy, will be speaking tomorrow. And on, also on Wednesday at 8 o'clock in the Pioneer Room, the film Super Size Me um, with Morgan Spurlock is, we'll be showing the film Wednesday, and he will be speaking Thursday about the film. Um, a little bit about him, he ate McDonald's and only McDonald's for 30 days for a month, so he's going to be speaking about his adventures doing that. Um, Tonight we have Maxine Nash with us. Uh, Maxine is a member of the Christian Peacemaking Team in Baghdad, where she was working with de detainees to ensure their rights as prisoners of war. Um, her work focused on detainees previously held by the Coalition Provin Provincial Authority and now um, the, detaini the detainees held by the U.S. military. Um, she has worked with CPT, Christian Peacemaking Team, in Palestine and was the director for the World Ministry, Ministries for Friends United Meeting, um, a Quaker church organization that is located in Richmond, Indiana. Um, Maxine is a native of Wacon, Iowa. So um, I think Max, Maxine's going to do um, a PowerPoint presentation type thing with some photographs and tell some pretty interesting stories about her adventures in Iraq. So um, if you could join me in welcoming Maxine. So. Have a mic. Can folks hear me in the back? Is the mic working? Okay, good. I'm kind of soft-spoken, so if you can't hear me, just wave your hand and I'll talk up a little bit. Um, I don't like podiums. Podiums make me look short, so I'm going to stand out here. <laughs> um, it's not like I'm tall or anything, but they make me look shorter. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to tell you tonight about Christian Peacemaker Teams, which is the group that I work with in Iraq, and tell you a little bit about our work there in Iraq. Um, Christian Peacemaker Teams is an initiative of what is known as the three historic peace churches. So the Church of the Brethren, the Mennonites, and the Quakers are the folks who started CPT. It is a violence reduction initiative. And that's sometimes a little bit hard to explain. We'll get into that into a minute about how you do violence reduction. But we are a faith-based group, and we work in areas throughout the world of lethal and interlethal conflict. Um, we, um, sorry about that, a little technology glitch here. We are about 15 years old, and we are sort of structured, um, structured on, okay. <laughs> I'm gonna just stop for a minute and let technology do its thing here. We're structured on sort of what would be a military model. And that may sound kind of funny for a violence reduction initiative, but it's a, it's a way of structuring ourselves that um, actually works and is easy to understand. Um, we have basically full-timers and we have part-timers. Um, the full-timers are people like me, people who, who work full-time year-round for CPT. So I work, this is my job, um, I work all the time for CPT, so I'm a full-timer. We also have reservists, and reservists are just like um, Army reservists would be. Um, they, They only work a few weeks to a few months each year. So they they come, oh, maybe sometimes during the summer if they are like uh, college professors or somebody like that who has time off in the summer. Or sometimes they're just people who don't want to commit to that kind of a full-time commitment. So they work on um, an occasional basis. We also are sort of like the military in the fact that we have sort of a basic training or a boot camp, if you will. Um, all of the full-timers and all of the reservists go through training. So we all spend a month, usually in Chicago, which is where our main office is, 
doing that training um, before we go out into the field. And it's sort of like boot camp. We learn how to work together. We learn how to live together. Um, we learn just how to get along in community because what happens then is that we have teams of people in places like Iraq, in Palestine, in Colombia, in Canada, and we work together as teams. And for example, in Iraq, we have an apartment in Baghdad. And so we live in Baghdad in a regular community with, with local people. And we all live together as a team and work together. Um, sometimes that's our biggest challenge, is living and working together as a team. Uh, you, know, it's, you know, we may be out in dangerous situations in the daytime, but you come home at night, and if somebody hasn't put the you know, sugar canister back where it's supposed to be, that's the thing that just drives you nuts. You know? um, working, working as a team can be a big challenge. But we find that that's our strength. Everybody brings different things to that team that are together very strong. So that's how we work. Um, we are, for the most part, volunteers. Um, I am compensated as a full-timer on a needs basis. My needs are covered. Um, when I'm home, my, my costs are covered of living. When I'm on team, all of my costs are covered. My travel expenses are covered. When I say needs-based, though, um, it is truly on a needs basis. When I joined this organization, we sat down and they said, what do you need? Not what do you want? Not what's you know, more comfortable for you? What do you need? And that's how I get compensated. Um, the reservists pay their own costs, but generally they raise money through their churches or through their communities for their costs. They generally are able to do that. Um, our main office is in Chicago. And we have a Canadian office as well. Most of our members are from North America, although right now we do have two Colombians who are members of our organization and um, a few Europeans. But for the most part, we're North America. So where do we work in the world? Um, like I said, we work in Iraq. We work in Palestine. We work in Colombia. We work in Canada. And we work here in the United States. And everybody understands usually the first three. And when you start getting to Canada and the US, people start going, huh? What do you do in Canada and the US? Um, in Canada, for example, our project is to work with native people there who have had their, log have had, um, their treaty rights basically abused by a logging company, um, being, this logging company being enabled by the Canadian government to go into treaty properties and log. Um, they needed help just for example because were experiencing difficulties with local law enforcement when they were trying to stop the logging company from doing that. So they set up a roving blockade to stop logging trucks from coming in. Part of our role there, for example, has been to just be a witness to all that. Um, it's amazing how you can reduce violence if you're standing somewhere with a camera in your notebook. Um, people may do wrong when there's nobody looking, but they're far more reluctant to do something like that when somebody is, is paying attention. So we work in all those places. We've also previously worked in Haiti and in Mexico during times of violence. We go where we're invited. Uh, the only exception to that rule has been Iraq. We've been in Iraq since October of 2002, and quite frankly, under Saddam's regime, it would have been pretty unsafe for anyone to invite us to come there. So we felt, um, given the situation, that it was important to go. So we went without an invitation. Um, we continue to be there uh, without an invitation, mostly because it's been hard for people to get organized to invite us. Um, but we, we feel like we should be there, so we continue to stay. And people have encouraged us to stay and want us to, to be there. So how do you do violence reduction? Um, it's, it's kind of a nebulous thing. How do you reduce violence? Um, it's, it's a creative challenge for us. It's different in every situation that we work in. Um, I explained to you, for example, what happens with, with our team in Canada. Um, what happened with our team in Palestine was that we have been accompanying school children to school. And that may not sound very dramatic, but what happened was there were Palestinian children going to school in a city called Hebron, and there were Israeli settler children. Now, if you know anything about that conflict, you know that those are two very opposing groups. Now, these are children. Children, of course, learn from their parents. Um, so what was happening is Palestinian children were walking to school. The Israeli settler kids were stoning them, um, literally throwing rocks at these kids on their way to school. So um, we were asked to come into the situation. And the only thing we did, basically, was walk these kids to school morning and night. 
every day. Um, it's amazing what happens when there's somebody paying attention. There, there was no more stoning. Um, well, I shouldn't say no more. There were still some, and some of our team members got hit with rocks. Um, but it dwindled because if you're standing there um, just as a presence, and as a presence with a camera, and as a presence willing to tell others about the violence, it does lessen the violence. Um, and that works on adults as well as children. How else do we do violence reduction? Um, we do, um, we do a com what we call accompaniment. In Colombia, the people that we work with are caught between two armed groups. There are paramilitaries who are basically funded by the government there, and there are guerrillas who are fighting the paramilitaries. So what happens is you're a regular average Joe on your you know, farm in a place, we work in a place called the Opon. Um, you're just trying to live your life, but there are armed groups fighting around you, and you get caught in the middle of that. Um, and those armed groups really don't care that much about you getting caught in the middle of that. In fact, they want to use you for their own purposes. So what we do in Colombia is we accompany these people in the Opon. That sometimes means putting up a tent in their front yard and living there if they're under threat. Because sometimes these armed groups, like I said, want to use them for their own purposes. You know, we want you to feed us, or we want you to do whatever. And if you refuse, you're killed. Um, it's, it makes a big difference if there is a North American there, if there is somebody else watching. Um, they're not as willing to do those violent acts if they know somebody is paying attention. And of course, like I said, again, we're there with our cameras and whatever else, and we, you know, tell them we have a website, and you know, we're going to put their picture on the website, you know, and that that makes people pay attention. Um, it makes them think twice about doing something that they think um, maybe they're doing in the quiet of Colombia, but they're not. If somebody like us is there paying attention, um, in Iraq, a lot of our work has been human rights documentation. Um, we were working with the detainees, with prisoners in the prison system from about um, August of last year uh, because what happened was the Red Cross headquarters in Baghdad was bombed. So the Red Cross had to leave for their own safety and their own security. They left and they were working out of Amman, Jordan. That left a big void in that <coughs> situation because the Red Cross normally would be the folks who would help people with um, with the prisoner situation. Say I'm whoever and I, my husband, for example, gets rounded up by the U.S. military and taken to prison. Um, normally it would be the Red Cross you would contact if you, you know, want to figure out where they were and could you visit them and all that sort of thing. Um, but the Red Cross wasn't there. And so we ended up doing a lot of that work. And what we discovered in the course of that work were we were finding abuses, we were finding um, a lot of what came out later in the media, of course, with the Abu Ghraib scandal. Um, and so one of the ways we reduced, we try to reduce violence is when we saw those things happening, we asked for meetings with upper level military and um, civilian folk who were there in Baghdad at the time. That included, um, we, we, you know, we shoot for the top, we asked for meetings with Paul Bremer and with General Sanchez. Um, we didn't get meetings with Bremer and Sanchez, but we did get meetings with Richard, Ambassador Richard Jones, who was Paul Bremer's deputy director, and with Colonel Mark Warren, who was General Sanchez's um, kind of second man <coughs> down. So we were trying to work with those levels of civilian and military people in charge to advocate for the human rights um, of the Iraqis who were being held and to ask them to realize that sometimes their policies were actually increasing the violence rather than decreasing it. Um, if, you, if you round up people and keep them in prison a long time and don't tell their families where they are and don't charge them with anything particularly and just hold them a long time, that makes people angry. Um, you can well imagine that if your family member was, was taken away like that and you didn't hear anything and you didn't know why they were being held and you couldn't find them, that you would certainly be angry about that. So we tried to make that point to civilian and military leaders. Um, so that's one way we work. We also, in Iraq, work a lot with the local human rights groups, with the Iraqi human rights groups. So we try to build a relationship between the Iraqi folks who do those sorts of things and the U.S. folks who do these sorts of things because it's not as easy or maybe as apparent as it would seem. Those relationships don't happen without a little nudge a lot of times. So we have um, introduced our, our working partners, our colleagues, 
to U.S. military people, to the civilian, uh, like when Paul Bremer was in charge, to some of his folks, to start building those relationships. And that's another way you can reduce violence, is just to get people talking, to get each side understanding what's going on with the other side. So those are some of the ways we do it. Um, it changes every day. We have to be really creative in what we do, and sometimes it's, it's a matter of doing very funny things to get the violence to reduce in a situation. Um, another cpt -er told me a story about being in Palestine, and it was a very tense situation where there was soldiers and there were um, Palestinians there that something was going on with, I forget what. And she knew it was tense and knew that it was coming soon, probably to shooting. And so she kind of went off to the side and started acting like a monkey, you know. Well, of course, everybody turned and laughed, you know, and, and then it kind of broke the spell. You know, that's sort of the creative things that people do sometimes just to get the violence to decrease. And, you know, you break the spell of it, and sometimes that's all it takes, is that people can then see a different way and maybe settle down and talk instead of shooting. Um, uh, one other question, a couple others that I can answer before, I'll show you some slides. It's always more fun to look at pictures than it is to hear me talk, but um, how do we get our funding, you might ask. How do you guys do this? And we get our funding by individual donations, so we can remain independent. Um, and that is one thing that we very much want to do because we are not affiliated then with anyone, which means that we have the freedom to do what we feel is right. So our funding generally comes from individuals. Um, we have a bit of funding that comes from churches as organizations and from um, larger church bodies, but most of it comes from individuals who feel um, that our work is valuable and really want to support us. And for us, that's, that's a great benefit. We, get, we don't get, I think we might have one funding source that is a grant right now, but very few. Um, so our funding is from individuals, which means that we have the freedom to work independently and to do what we feel we need to in any given situation. How did I get involved in this? Um, I was working for a Quaker church organization that was one of the founding members of this group, and they hold two permanent seats on the steering committee. So one day, um, somebody marched into my office with a stack of paper this high and said, oh, by the way, um, you have to go to the steering committee meeting for this group, and here you go. Here's everything you need to know about them. Um, so I landed on their steering committee in October of 2001 and at the time was working as the director of world ministries for this Quaker church organization. Um, I left that job in March of 2003 and started exploring work then with CPT. Went on a delegation. Um, part of the work we do in CPT is delegations. We take people for two weeks at a time to all the places where we work. So I went on a delegation to Iraq just after the war. It was the first delegation we took in after the war and felt very compelled that war was not a good answer for anything, um, that it simply was not an answer to problems and felt compelled to, to do something about that, basically. So um, I was invited to come to training, to this sort of boot camp, like I said. So I did that in the summer of 2003 and then became a full-timer in November of 2003. So I'm just coming up on a year or so, and I'll probably spend my next two years in Iraq. Um, we spend about three months in the field, and then we spend a month or two home. That gives us a break and um, gives us a, a bit of time off and a bit of time to do public speaking like this. So I'll probably spend most of my time in Iraq. Okay, you guys look like you could do a few pictures, so let's see if we can get technology working again here. And I'll ask Ramsey to turn off the lights there. And I may ask Ramsey to come and help me with technology. Oh, I can think I got it, Ramsey. This is, this is a view of, um, from my rooftop. Like I said, we have an apartment in Baghdad, and that apartment is 
just in a in a regular building in a regular neighborhood in Baghdad. Um, the neighborhood I live in is called Karada Dahil, which means Karada inside. Um, it's a it's a relatively safe, in fact, it's a very safe neighborhood as far as Baghdad goes. They tell us it's one of the safer ones. Um, it's kind of a mixed neighborhood. This, as you can see, if you look up here, um, is a Christian church, and not too far over from it is the minaret of a mosque. Um, it's, you know, there's a bit of everybody in my neighborhood, which makes it a very interesting neighborhood to live in. And very comfortable for me as a Christian, there are churches close by and, and um, other folks that I can relate to. Um, these are, you know, just rooftops in the neighborhood. You can kind of see, you can see, um, in some places you can see there's water tanks, like right here. Um, what happens is most people, water pumps from the city, and then they pump it up to their roofs, into these holding tanks, and then it does a gravity flow back into the, um, into the buildings. Um, one of the things that, that we have become intimately um, involved with since we live there is the infrastructure problems. Um, we, at one point this summer, did not get water for five days from the city. So when, um, you know, a lot of times people will ask me, well, what's, uh, what's the situation like with the infrastructure? Um, well, I say, well, we didn't get water for five days this summer, and it's been kind of off and on sometimes. So the, that, it, it's still difficult. Um, and we're, it's very hard to pinpoint why that problem is. It's hard to know if there's sabotage to the pipes, if it's just that they're old and they weren't fixed under the sanctions, if the water treatment plant isn't working properly, exactly what's going on. But the long and short of it is, it's not working. Um, so this is, this is my neighborhood. Um, the next picture is also my neighborhood looking out from our building the other way. And this is what they call the green zone. If you hear about the green zone in the news, um, this is basically it. Um, this building right here is actually where the Iraqi interim government meets. And you can't see it very well, but way over here is a sort of a blue dome. That was Saddam's palace. That's where uh, Paul Bremer had his offices. And this, of course, is the Tigris River. And there's a nice park right here by the Tigris. Um, you can see right along here, you can, you can see it. There's a, a, a fence looking thing. What it is is they're actually 15 foot concrete blast barriers. All around the green zone are basically these blast barriers. Um, it is a fortified zone. Just because it's fortified though, doesn't mean they don't have problems. Um, because my neighborhood is in a very convenient place for uh, insurgents, to fire across the river at the green zone. That's often what happens from my neighborhood. Um, and sometimes they, insurgents don't get it right, and sometimes the mortars fall in my neighborhood. There was a soccer park farther up in this, in this park by the Tigris where um, a number of children were killed when a mortar fell. So there are civilian casualties due to the, um, you know, just sometimes random things that happen now in Baghdad. And these are, these are U.S. helicopters flying over. That's a pretty regular event in my neighborhood. Um, helicopters fly overhead quite a bit. Um, part of what we did in CPT um, just this year was started a very uh, determined effort at learning language. And I was one of the sort of prototype kids for this program. So January, in six weeks in January and February, I did a homestay with a family and did classroom instruction in Arabic and stayed with this family. And you can see these are some of my family siblings here helping me with my homework. Um, they were just like kids anywhere. They were noisy and um, had a lot of energy and drove me crazy sometimes, but I loved them to death. And um, if you ever wonder why you do anything, of course, it's always for the kids. And so whenever I think about um, Iraq, I think about these kids. They live pretty close to my our apartment, they're about, oh, five, ten minute walk away from our apartment, so they're, they're really close to us, so I go and visit quite a bit. Um, their names are, the, the tallest one is Aya, whoops, and the others are uh, Huda and Doa and Mortitha. Whoop. Um, one of the things w we do in CPT, like I said, is take delegations. Um, and when, when we have delegations come to Iraq, um, people who come in delegations can be anybody. They can be, you know, anybody who signs up and wants to go. And so we get 
whole bunch of varied people with varied interests coming on delegations. And what we do on delegations is try to expose people to a situation, um, try to inform them about a whole bunch of different sides of that situation. Um, and generally, they come home then and, and tell other people about it. So when we take people um, on delegations to Iraq, we take them all over the place. We take them to churches, to hospitals, to government officials, um, just whatever we think might be sort of important to see. This happens to be a visit with the governing council in Abu Ghraib, um, the, the t village of Abu Ghraib, which is close to the prison. And this gentleman on the right is actually a gentleman named Bill Basinger, who's from Des Moines. Um, and he came on a delegation with us. And he's talking to one of the members of the, the governing council there. And they had quite a long discussion. He was over in the corner talking to him for quite a long time. One of the other things we do um, while we're in Iraq and, and in other places where we work too is talking to soldiers. Um, when my computer decides to participate, we'll see that. I'm sorry about that. I've had a little bit of problem with this program today. We'll try it again and see if it'll go. Technology is a great thing, except when it doesn't work. <coughs> it'll it'll scroll through these slides so you get to see them once more here. So the other thing that we do while we are in Iraq and in other places is talk to soldiers. Um, this was also in the village of Abu Ghraib, and um, I'm handing that soldier a leaflet. And it was one that we developed prior to, um, prior to the scandal at Abu Ghraib when we started seeing human rights abuses with the, with the detainees. And um, basically, we developed a flyer that just reminded the soldiers about their responsibilities in human rights and also reminded them, you know, hey, when you go home, you're going to have to live with whatever you do. So just remember that here and home might be two different places, but you're the same in both places. So um, what, what is good for your soul at home is good for your soul here. And um, you might want to think about what you do. So that's what I was doing, but it wasn't. That's not all we do as soldiers. I mean, we just talk to soldiers. We see them on the street. We just talk to them. We just say, "Hi, how are you? Where are you from? You know, um, what's a nice guy like you doing here in Baghdad?" And of course, they ask us the same question because it's pretty unusual to see an American walking down the street in Baghdad. Um, and we just we just try to, you know, be a friendly face for them. Those guys are under a lot of stress. Um, this is by far and away the most dangerous thing I do in Baghdad or in any part of Iraq is talk to soldiers because they are targets. Um, if there's a bomb that's going to go off, it's going to happen around soldiers. If there's a problem going to happen, it's going to happen around soldiers. But we feel like it's really important to talk to them and just be a support for them. While, although we don't agree with a military presence there, these are human beings. Um, some of them don't agree with it either. Uh, some of them say, I, don't, I didn't agree with the war, I don't want to be here. I feel like I'm kind of stuck because I'm in the military. Um, so some of them don't agree with it either. So we do a lot of um, just chatting with them, basically, seeing you know what kind of things they're facing on any given day. Um, a large part of our work in, in Baghdad is working with detainees. We spend probably you know more than 50% of our time working with with detainees and their families. This happened to be a family. Um, you can, you can. This picture is of the the person who's actually detained. His name is Kusei, and he's only 15. Um, he was detained, and his family didn't know where he went for months. They they weren't sure where where he had been taken. They weren't sure exactly why. 
um, they, they contacted us for help, and we were trying to help them find him. They finally, we did finally find him in a camp in the southern part of Iraq called Camp Buka, which is in Umm Qasr, very far away from where these folks actually live, a good eight, nine hour drive from where they live. Um, but you can imagine if you had a 15 year old son and he was detained one night by US troops and you didn't know where he went for months, you'd be frantic, um, and his family was. So that's part of the work that we do. We don't advocate for release of prisoners because we have no way of knowing whether they are guilty or innocent of whatever they've been charged with. The only thing we ask for is that their human rights are acknowledged and maintained and that they are treated as human beings, basically. Um, so it's, it's difficult because, for example, Kuse is a minor um, and he is in Camp Buka. He is not separated from the rest of the general prison population. He's in with the adults. Um, in any prison circumstance, that's usually not the way it goes and it's not really appropriate. So that's the sort of thing we might advocate for. Um, his family did get to visit him eventually, and I don't know if Kuse has been released or not, mostly because his family lives in an area called Abu Hishma, which is a village about 40 miles, 40, 50 miles north of Baghdad, and it's been too dangerous for us to go back there and chat with the family. Um, Abu Hishma was an interesting case because, and, and that's another part of our work in CPT, is documenting things as we find them out. Um, Abu Hishma is, is a small farming village, um, but in November of 2003, there were two U.S. servicemen killed outside the village in an attack. And so what happened is that the military commander close to the village of Abu Hishma encircled the whole village in razor wire, about five miles of razor wire, set up a curfew, gave all of the villagers identity cards, so they had to show an identity card to get in and out of the village, and basically said to the village, when you turn over the perpetrators of this crime, I'll take the razor wire away and lift the curfew. So it's collective punishment. He punished a whole village until they could find who had killed these U.S. servicemen. Um, that is against international law, obviously. And so the reason I have this picture is because this is what it looks like in the village of Abu Hishma. The day we were visiting, you know, Humvees just drive down the street. Um, you can see off to the left, there's a, there's a child here, a boy. Um, that's what they're going to remember. You know, for us, part of violence reduction is reducing a presence like this that will make people respond in kind. Um, you know, if you're a child and this is what you see driving down your streets, you're probably going to get angry. And, and if there's razor wire around your village and if you can't come and go freely, um, that's probably not going to um, engender you to like who is ever doing that. So people often ask me, well, why don't they like us? Well, there's some, there's some quite obvious reasons why they don't like us in some places. Well, we're just going to have technology problems tonight, I'm afraid. Um, I'm going to try a few more, and if this keeps happening, we'll just go on. Sorry about that. I'm, I'm always wondering what my technology is going to do when I set it up, and some days it works better than others. <laughs> Must be a full moon or something. Um, this is a, a picture, part of, part of the other work that we do besides building relationships with people is um, highlighting issues when we see them. This woman's name is Laura Wa'ad and she was just 
um, a regular Iraqi woman who, she and her husband, um, living in Baghdad, one night um, during a night raid, the military came and um, basically arrested her husband and didn't really give them a reason why that he was being arrested. And when they asked, um, they were told, it's not any of your concern. So he was arrested and taken to prison. She came to us and, and couldn't find him. It had been months, and she was not able to locate him. And so she came to us and asked if we could help, and we tried to locate him. And we looked for months, and we couldn't find him. Um, and so we were getting a bit desperate ourselves. And at that time, there were, there were a lot of reporters in Baghdad coming to us and asking us if we had information, if we had talked to people. So we finally decided, hey, maybe this is one way to figure out where this guy is or to at least get the issue highlighted. So this gentleman's name is um, Jeffrey Gentleman, the guy in the blue shirt here, and he is a New York Times reporter. And so what we did was we took Jeffrey Gentleman around to meet Laura Waad and um, Cusay's father and family and a few other folks, and he wrote an article that then turned up in the New York Times in March. Um, and so we do a lot of that. We do a lot of talking to reporters, a lot of getting the word out, because there's a lot of problems right now in regular media. Um, they are reporting on bombs and reporting on all of the you know day-to-day -day really big news events that are going on, but some of this underlying stuff that may be sort of fueling the insurgency or fueling the problems doesn't get reported on. So that's what that's what Jeffrey Gentleman did, and that's one of the one of the things that we do to reduce violence, too, is to put people like a newspaper reporter in touch with somebody like Laura Waad, who has this situation. Um, Laura's husband was abducted in, or I'm sorry, arrested in uh, November of last year. He is still in prison. Um, there's not any release date that we know of for him. He is also in Camp Buka, this prison in the south of Iraq. And Laura was pregnant at the time of the previous picture, and since um, since, let's see, she had this, she had the baby in July, I think it was, and the baby's name is Athra, and she's adorable. And part of what we did now, since her husband was still abducted, was do again what sort of the Red Cross might do. We helped her send a message to her husband in prison, um, the fact that the baby was born, and that sort of thing. Um, again, it's still a bit of a question why he's still being detained. Um, it's been months. You know, there's, the way that works with prisoners right now is that under international law, they have to be reviewed every six months. And if they still are what the, um, the forces that are keeping them consider them to be an imminent threat, then they can be kept for another six, month and six months and then reviewed. Um, there's a new process in Iraq right now. They're trying to shorten that process up. The U.S. military and the Iraqis are trying to work together to do that. However, we're not sure yet. It's still a little early to tell whether that's working or not. What we do know is that some of these folks have been detained for months, if not close to a year, which is an incredible hardship to their family. And the Red Cross estimates that somewhere around 90% of the people being detained by the U.S. military are innocent. Um, and you can imagine that if you are innocent and being detained, you would be that much angrier uh, when you get out. Now, we don't find a lot of people, surprisingly enough, when they get out, that are advocating revenge. Um, you know, if it were me and they kept me for a year and I, you know, my family was without me and, and worried about me, I'd probably be wanting revenge. But quite honestly, we don't see that. We do see people say, though, even though I might not be a person who would perpetrate an act, that they would support it. Um, so what we were telling the military long ago has turned out to probably be somewhat accurate, that the heavy-handed tactics that we're using probably fuel the insurgency. This is a gentleman named Dr. Hamid. Um, Dr. Hamid is a, he is a cardiothoracic surgeon, and he is also the principal of a university called Al Yarmouk University. He started it as a private institution with a friend of his, and it is in Bakuba, which has been a hotspot for the insurgency. Um, what happened in June of this year was that um, insurgents were fighting in Bakuba and happened to be fighting close to the college and took refuge in the college, overpowered the college guards and took refuge in the college. Uh, the U.S. was trying to rout the insurgents 
um, weren't getting it done on the ground, and so they, they dropped missiles on the school. This all happened in the course of about four to six hours, uh, Dr. Hamid told us. So this is, he's pointing out the damage to the school. You can see also there's remnants of a car here. Um, there was a car with a bomb in it that had been parked there by the insurgents in the school. So there was a lot of damage. Um, buildings were structurally damaged. Obviously this building is, is totally damaged. Um, lots of damage to the school. So Dr. Hamid got in touch with us because he wasn't sure what to do about this. He, you know, his school's been blown up. How does he go about getting compensation for it and rebuilding? So he came to us and we helped him negotiate the U.S. military system. And he um, asked for compensation and he was told, okay, bring some bids back, get tenders, which he did. Um, and we thought it was all going along pretty well. And then all of a sudden one day they said, we're sorry, we can't pay you. Um, the money that we thought was there to do this with has been moved into another fund. There's no money left to rebuild your school. Um, of course, we as Americans said, wait a minute, there's 20 billion for reconstruction. <laughs> um, where is the 20 billion? This is obviously what we think might be part of reconstruction funds. So we went back with Dr. Hamid and, and asked the military that very question. Um, said, we're, we're not understanding where the 20 billion for reconstruction has gone. And um, we also made the point that if you have a college that has been bombed by the U.S., for whatever reason, the college has been bombed, um, the students are angry about that. And if you don't um, provide compensation for them to rebuild, what do you think a lot of angry students in a town where there is a strong insurgency movement going, what do you think they're going to do? Um, doesn't it make sense that they might then become part of the insurgency? So we made that point and apparently they took it to heart because then they did decide to pay compensation on the school. So Dr. Hamid had asked for 1.5 million, he got 1.2. So that will be enough for him to rebuild and get the school going again. Um, it's a small school, it would probably be, you know, maybe the size of, um, well, it would be smaller than Drake, but, um, you know, maybe the size of Clark College in Dubuque or something like that. Um, small college, but still a lot of students there who then had nowhere to go and nowhere to study because it was too late for them to transfer and get into other universities and other schools at that point. And in that college, um, there are, it's a very mixed um, population, there are about 50% women, 50% men, um, and it's, a, it's quite a good school from what I've been told. Um, this is back to my neighborhood again, just to, to kind of talk about the situation in general. This is, this is my neighborhood on the day of a church bombing. Um, remember I showed you before there are churches, this, in the first picture I showed you, there's this church over here, and then there's the mosque, and then there's um, a cloud of smoke from a church that was bombed about about a month and a half ago now. Um, this is taken from my rooftop. So, uh, you know, when people ask me, is Iraq dangerous? You know, it's dangerous for Iraqis. It's probably dangerous for me. It's just, that's what it is right now. Um, that's the situation that Iraqis live in every day. So just after this bomb went off, um, we happened to have two team members who were at church somewhere in that neighborhood. We weren't exactly sure where. They had said we were going to a different church tonight. Um, on a Sunday is a working day in the Muslim calendar, uh, Muslim weeks, so uh, church services and Christian churches are usually held at about 6 o'clock in the evening, 6, 6.30. These bombs went off at about quarter to 7. So the first one went off. Um, we went to look for our team members, and then a bomb went off at this church. Um, and I was standing probably about a block and a half away from that church when it blew up. And the family where I had lived, um, doing language study, lived about a block and a half away from that. So it, the violence touches everybody. Um, there's, there's very little way to get away from the violence there. Um, this is also in my neighborhood. Um, and this happened about a week or two before I came back. I've been home about two and a half weeks now. And this is when you hear about um, about soldiers being, uh, or about patrols being bombed. This is sort of, this is what happens. Um, somebody, you can kind of see back here, just in this median, there's a little hole. What happens is insurgents will plant what they call improvised explosive de devices, which are homemade bombs, basically, in a median or in garbage or just, you know, somewhere. 
And when they see a U.S. patrol come by, when they see hum Humvees come by, um, they can blow up these bombs using remote detonation. So they might have something like a garage door opener or you know um, a car door opener that they've got set for this bomb, and they blow it up as the patrols come by. So when I said the most dangerous thing I do is be close to soldiers, again, that's why. Um, what happened this day is, um, you know, people often often say, well, are people angry at soldiers, or how do they react to soldiers? The soldiers were down the street coming up in Humvees. Um, residents and shopkeepers saw some suspicious activity in this building up here and stopped the soldiers from coming up the street, said, stop, there's something funny going on up there. And the soldiers stopped, and then they figured that whoever had the had planted the bomb got nervous and detonated it at that point. Um, so what happened was the soldiers were spared because some Iraqis noticed unusual activity. There were Iraqis killed in that bombing. Um, if you're just walking by or driving by in a car, that's usually the people who get hurt in those kind of bombs, just innocent people on the street that that happens to. But Iraqis don't want that kind of violence in their own neighborhoods, in their own um, places, because they don't want to live with that either. So when they see it, they do tell people and they do try to warn soldiers and um, keep it from being in their own neighborhoods. Um, this just is just to show you what what it looks like, you know, where they planted the bomb. The Iraqi police are in evidence now. Um, there's not a lot of them, but they are there and they show up when things happen. Um, this U.S. soldier is taking a picture of us taking pictures. Um, <laughs> it's it's not quite the same situation it used to be with soldiers. We're, we don't feel as free to talk to them now because, for one thing, they're nervous and um, they don't want to be distracted. And we